If you could make one of your favorite meals nine different ways, wouldn't you have nine favorite meals? <laughs> well, I'll show you how to take a common dish that everybody loves, turn it into nine meals, immediately expanding the variety of my cooking so that I get variety into my cooking. I'll explain all about it today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. Uh, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern right here on my Chef Todd Moore page on Facebook. It's the free public weekly show for the methods, the techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. And since it's free and to the public, go ahead, share it with as many people as you like because the topic that we talk about, about today is going to empower thousands of people all over the world. And if you want a private email reminder of when I'm going live, sign up at webcookingclasses.com slash live. Oh, if you want to see what I'm cooking, that's the right way. If you want to see, get still getting used to the new office studio, I tried to damp down the echo, I still hear it a little bit. The lights are still a little weird. Nonetheless, I love making Coquille Saint-Jacques. That way, that's right. Um, that's what it is, and it's so much fun to say. Coquille Saint-Jacques, it's as creamy off your tongue as it is uh, on your tongue, but what it is is uh, my local seafood place, Miss Mary's, got these little um, bay scallops, the little sweet bay scallops, not the big sea scallops. So a simple cream sauce, uh, butter, uh, uh, onion and garlic sauteed in butter, flour to make roux, milk to make bechamel, mount it with a little cream, add a little brandy, poach the scallops in it, serve it with this way, brown rice and uh, asparagus spears. How do I do it? Well, I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook uh, because I create my own cooking style. Uh, I practice pro methods and I wind up loving my cooking. That's the carefree cook's creed with a uh, osprey on there. Probably catching some fish. I need to teach those osprey how to catch the fish. Uh, hey, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so glad when Tuesdays roll around uh, because we get another crack, at just a little bit more of the code, of the Carefree Cooks code, the, the methods, the philosophies that you need to become truly free in the kitchen and become a carefree cook, a cook with no care. We're going to talk about how to do that today, the quickest way to do it, the quickest way to increase your variety as well as your pride. But first, I've got a what am I for you? Yeah, that's the right way. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to, you think I'm making a crazy deal about this, but it's a mirror image for me. So when I move one, nonetheless, you don't care. Uh, it's a little bit of culinary vocabulary. What do we call carrot, onion, celery in French cuisine? And I think I have a hint there that it's even eight letters. Tell me in the comment section below, carrot, onion, celery in France. Okay, look, we all know the benefits of being a carefree cook, right? I just read them all in, in, in our creed. But one of the greatest things about true freedom in your kitchen is that you're not bound by anybody else's wants, desires, ingredients, not bound by written instructions about what you might like in your kitchen, right? It's, I used to tell a joke during my live demonstrations, and this shows you how long ago it was, um, but I would say, how does Martha Stewart tell me what's good in my kitchen from her jail cell? Um, and this is how long ago? What was that? That poor Martha. 
uh, took the fall for everybody. Nonetheless, don't let Martha tell you about what to cook because cooking is not about following written directions. Carefree cooking is about commanding the methods of cooking so you can use the ingredients you want for any diet or any desire. And when you command the methods, then you have the freedom to change anything or everything about a recipe or just make up your own recipes. Right? A, a musician, speaking of things I've been saying for decades, a musician doesn't have to have sheet music to play an instrument and you don't need a recipe to cook because if you just change the method with one of your favorite dishes, you create a brand new dish. Would you like to know how we do this? Would you like to see? Yes. Thumbs up. Heart, smile, whatever button you can push most quickly. You want to see, I call this nine ways to Parmesan. You want to see nine ways to Parmesan today? It's very simple. You just change the method. Okay, it's that simple of a concept. Just cook the same thing, but change how you cook it. And now it's a brand new dish. It's a simple concept but it takes a few higher level foundational skills, okay? In other words, you have to be up on your cooking methods. And normally, I recommend becoming comfortable with just one basic cooking method and then change the ingredients for each meal. That's usually the way that I teach. Becoming proficient in the nine steps of the basic saute method will have you making sauteed chicken, sauteed beef, sauteed tofu, sauteed mushrooms. You get the idea. Be proficient at one method and then you change the ingredients and you make a whole mess of meals. That's the way I teach cooking. It works for decades. It's worked for thousands of people all over the world. It has nothing to do with instructions. Repeat the method, but change the ingredients and you get a new dish. We're going to twist that today. Keep all the ingredients, but change the method for a new dish. Okay, so this is a little bit Chef Todd teaching upside down. And I'm going to challenge myself today to come up with nine ways to cook the same dish. And if you're on your own personal path to becoming a carefree cook, then you already know that focusing on the reliable, right? The repeatable methods of cooking empowers you over written recipes. It gives you confidence. It has you creating instead of cooking. The, the world of difference between creating and following somebody's written instructions is where all the pride, all the enjoyment, all the fun, and all the success happens. It's in that gap there. But you got to know what these methods are. And you, you have to be able to anticipate the different results that they'll produce. So let's have a quick refresher of the methods that we focus on in web cooking classes. And by that, I mean um, there's no deep frying, there's no pan frying, there's no gadgets. We don't do fried chicken in web cooking classes. Terrible way to cook things. And gadgets, they take all the joy out of cooking for me. So let's start with the hands-on, smell it as it's going, <laughs> alter the path if you have to, basic cooking methods. Let's start with roasting. Roasting is an indirect heat convective cooking method. So you got to know that the oven heats up air and the hot air cooks your food. Pretty easy method, right? You can marinate things to be roasted. Um, you could dry rub things to be roasted. You can stuff, roll, roulade, compose roasted items. But either way, you basically put it in the oven and you wait for the finished results that you're looking for. And notice I said, the results that you're looking for. That's because carefree cooks are not cooking by time and temperature, right? How long at what temperature? Worst way to cook. Carefree cooks cook by quantifying and observing the desired results. You look for the effects of heat on food that you want. But look, that's a whole another class. So roasting method um, is hot, dry air. Expect something to dry out. Expect something to shrink. Expect fats to render to the bottom of the pan. Good in a lot of situations, bad in many others. Let's move on quickly because then I need to get to the nine ways to Parmesan. Today, we're going to take chicken Parmesan and I'm going to show you how to make it nine ways to turn it into nine Parmesans. But I want to review these methods first because next is the basic saute method. Direct heat, 
conductive cooking method where the things happen quickly. And you need items that are already thin and tender because of the intense heat. And the basic saute method has nine repeatable steps. It's lesson number two in web cooking classes because it is so important and it's the fastest way to get cooking. If you can repeat the nine steps in basic saute, you can cook anything. Grilling is also a direct heat source, conductive cooking method where the heat source is directly below the item being cooked. Because things happen so quickly, intense heat, this also calls for something thin and tender because the thicker items will burn on the outside before ever being cooked in the middle. And nothing ever tenderizes on a barbecue grill. <laughs> There's no, no time to be tender. Uh, thin and tender is the rule on the grill. So along with eight steps in a good grilling method, um, you could brush the item with fat to promote browning, turn the item 90 degrees to get pretty crosshatch grill marks, uh, always cook to a precise internal temperature, and always rest the item, allowing the juices to distribute. Then we got moist methods like steaming, uh, poaching, simmering, all indirect convective cooking methods where the liquid is heated and passes the heat on to the food. Nothing is ever going to get brown in a moist cooking method. Remember this, get this into your head. You can't toast a wet piece of bread. Put a wet piece of bread in your toaster, see what happens. Moisture never gets above 212 degrees Fahrenheit where it turns to steam or 100 degrees Celsius. And caramelization of sugars one of the four effects of heat on food, that takes place at 320 or 160 Celsius. So if you want something brown, don't steam it. <laughs> That's not going to work. Steaming is indirect contact with the moisture. Poaching and simmering is direct contact with the cooking liquid. And boiling is not a cooking method. <laughs> Web cooking classes students already know why boiling is not a cooking method, and I don't have time for that soapbox today. Then there are combination cooking methods like braising and stewing. This is where you might brown something first and then finish it in the oven or finish it in moisture. So there you go. There you go. Those are your basic cooking methods, right? It's what I teach in web cooking classes because it's the how you cook that you need when recipes are only telling you what to cook. They do a good job of giving you ideas, combinations of ingredients, but the how to cook, yeah, they, they suck. They, they're not, you're not going to learn how to cook with written instructions. So I'm going to make nine meals out of one using the methods that I just mentioned. Drum roll. <laughs> Here they are again. Roasting in the oven. Saute on the stop, top of the stove in a pan. Grilling using direct heat from below. Steaming indirect moist heat poaching, soft, direct, moist heat, simmering, mild, direct, moist heat, braising, combination cooking method, stewing, combination cooking method with more moisture. Oh, and I'm going to throw in smoking as well. Uh, I love smoking stuff. Uh, smoking is an indirect, dry, convective cooking method where the burning wood, the smoking wood, gives flavor to the food, but ultimately it's a roasted item. It's not, it's not cooked by the burning wood. Okay, so those are nine basic cooking methods, and if you know them, and if you can repeat them reflexively, then you can turn one dish into nine as well. So let's get a real world example of this, something everybody knows, a popular dish that could be on the table in any household. How about chicken parmesan? All right? You know it, chicken parmesan. It's a chicken breast covered in tomato sauce and cheese at its simplest. And this is a really good example too because you could make it eggplant parmesan if you want for our vegetarian friends. A anything that you, you want a parmesan, go ahead and, and parm it. Par parm your heart out, okay? Um, it really doesn't matter what is under your tomato sauce. <laughs> What's under your cheese? Because no matter what it is, you can turn it into nine meals really quickly. Are you ready? You wanna see how I do this? Okay, are you ahead of me already? <laughs> is your carefree cook's mind already whipping up the different versions of chicken parm? All right, so don't get ahead of me yet. I know a lot of you can do this already, but let me show you how we do it. So chicken or eggplant parmesan is our example dish. Dish number one, roasted. Take my chicken breast, put it on a pan. 
put it in the oven to a finished internal temperature. Put tomato sauce on it, top it with my melty cheese, put it back under the broiler. I've got my first Parmesan, chicken or eggplant, whichever you wish. Cook the item first, then sauce it, cheese it, melt the cheese and heat up the sauce, baby. All right, so that's Parm 1, we'll call it. Oh, oh, wait a minute. That chicken is naked that, that I just described. And if you want that, that crispy, crunchy crust on your chicken or your eggplant, you're gonna need the three-part breading procedure. And that's another skill I can show you for sure. The, the flour sticks to the chicken, the egg sticks to the flour, the crumb sticks to the egg, the egg coagulates under heat, stiffening and shrinking, and it creates the crust. So it, you could bread the chicken first, then roast it in the oven to a precise finish temperature, then sauce it, cheese it, and broil it. There's parm number two. I'm on my way. Uh, so what if you did chicken or eggplant parmesan saute? Saute the chicken breast, remove it from the pan, saute some onions or garlic, uh, uh, deglaze with red wine, reduce the red wine till it's almost dry, add your tomato sauce, return the chicken to the pan, spoon the sauce over it, top it with the mozzarella cheese, put a lid on the pan to steam the cheese, and you've got sauteed chicken parm that will have different flavors and characteristics than the roasted one. We added red wine, we added garlic and onions and so on, all right? So that's parm number three, saute. Oh, and that one's naked too. So if you wanted to coat this chicken or eggplant in crumbs also, then you'd have to use a combination cooking method. So you'd use that three-part breading procedure I told you about. Basically, you would toast the crumbs in a saute pan because it's not gonna cook all the way through before the crumbs burned. And I used to do this, oh my goodness, I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, you toast the crumbs first in the saute pan so they get toasty, and then you would finish it in the oven to a final temperature. Uh, we'll call that Parm 3A, okay, that's an extra bonus. Uh, the story that I thought about when I was a chef at the National Security Agency, uh, Chicken Parmesan Day was my bu busiest day. It started out where they used to buy the chicken cutlets pre-breaded in a box, in a bag, and as the chef responsible for the food, I found that totally unacceptable, even though I could just drop them in the deep fryer and have it done in about 45 minutes. Instead, we took fresh chicken breast, pounded it flat, and I'm talking chicken on every table you can see in the kitchen, a few hundred chicken breasts and chefs with two mallets in each hand, bu -bu 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 pounding the chicken, three-part breading procedure on sheet pans, then it would go on the grill. We had the big breakfast flat top grill. In between breakfast and lunch, I would toast all my chicken parmesans back on the sheet pan in the oven. Anyway, that's a tangential story. You didn't need to know about it, but I've done this same procedure for what do I make, 600 chicken parm, something like that. All right, since we're talking about combination cooking methods, right, toasting first and finishing in the oven, let's get away from the chicken breast or the breaded eggplant. How about using a braising method with chicken legs and thighs? How about chicken parts parmesan? You ever think of that? This is how I would do it. I'd brown the chicken parts in olive oil or some kind of my favorite oil first, get them nice and brown, render some of the fat on the skin, deglaze the pan with some wine or broth, reduce it till it's almost dry, uh, or maybe I would saute onions and garlic first and then deglaze it or deglaze it and cook the onions in the wine, doesn't matter. Add my tomato sauce, put the chicken legs and thighs back in, cook the whole thing low and slow for a long time. At the very end, grate cheese on top of it in the pan, put the lid back on, let the cheese melt. Chicken parm four, braised chicken parm. Uh, grilled chicken parm is really easy. Grill your chicken breast, put hot tomato sauce on top, put some grated cheese on so it melts faster. Uh, and then you can close the grill lid and let the cheese melt if you want. Um, a grilled chicken is going to taste, <laughs> look, uh, feel much different than a breaded or sauteed or roasted one for sure. You get different results. Parm number five is my grilled parm. If you want to remove all excess fat from your cooking, this chicken or eggplant should probably be steamed. What if you steamed a chicken breast in chicken broth? or poached it? What if you had a nice vegetable broth to steam your eggplant in? And like I said, 
It's not going to be brown. It's not going to be crunchy, crispy, but it is going to be really moist and flavorful. You could even poach chicken or eggplant in tomato sauce. Oh my goodness, why didn't I think of that before? Parm number six, poached in either a flavorful liquid or right in the tomato sauce. And look, we don't have to have a chicken breast or slices of eggplant. What if we cubed the chicken, sauteed cubed chicken or, or poached cubed chicken in tomato sauce uh, or, or poached cubed eggplant, right? It doesn't always have to be flat sliced put on a plate uh, after diced tomatoes, maybe some onion, some garlic, right? And you would have like a chicken Parmesan ratatouille or an eggplant ratatouille, which is a little bit redundant, but that's the way we would do it. So that's totally different from the rest of the parms. Ring the bell, please. This way. Ding! Parm number seven. There it is. Similarly, your new Parmesan creation could be stewed. What if you diced or julienned chicken or, or sliced eggplant, browned in oil in a pan, then stewed with tomatoes and vegetables? right? It's, it's like a, a chicken Parmesan chili or, or an eggplant Parmesan chili. Bing! Number eight is what it is. And if you really want to go over the top flavor, get out your smoker. <laughs> get those chips ready because I even show you how to smoke items on your stovetop in web cooking classes. And that flavor, as you know, is one of my favorites. So how about this as the finale? How about smoked chicken or eggplant with a smoked tomato sauce over the top, I know. Smoke the main product, the chicken or the eggplant, and then smoke whole tomatoes or smoke red peppers as well. The skin comes right off, take the seeds out, make a smoked tomato sauce. And then maybe you could buy some smoked mozzarella and, <laughs> and then you would just have to get some real peaty whiskey, I guess. You, you would feel like you were eating uh, uh, in front of a campfire in an Italian countryside. Bing! Number nine. There it is, folks. I did it. I did it. One dish that everybody knows, a dish that you can make very simple, a dish you can make very complicated, but it can be a new dish just by changing the method. Okay, so now, now it's time for you to think about your favorite dishes. What if you cooked the same exact ingredients from one of your favorite dishes, but you changed the method from like roasting to grilling? What if you changed it from a dry saute to a moist poach? Instead of those quick meals, I don't know, maybe a combination cooking method, like braising, or stewing something a little slower, you let cook for hours. Maybe that would change the dish that you you like, your favorite dish. If you want to increase the variety in your cooking, you have to cre increase the variety of your cooking. And it's the basic mantra of carefree cooking. I say it all the time. It's not what you cook, it's how you cook. And that means method always comes before ingredients. And method always replaces recipes because with a dependable, repeatable method, you write the recipes. That's the way it goes. Oh, hey, back to the what am I for today. A little bit of culinary uh, uh, vocabulary. Carrot, onion, celery in French cuisine with eight letters. It's called mirepoix. 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 Not merry pox. <laughs> Merry pox. No, mirepoix. It's the combination of carrot, onion, celery, and many countries across the world have their version of mirepoix. That's another lesson. But let me ask you this. Do you know someone who could benefit from the idea that they really have nine meals when they think they just have one? Well, go ahead and like, love, share this video with them so they can become truly free in their cooking as well. And oh my goodness, here is the big announcement I've been talking about. Oh, I'm so excited. This Saturday, this coming Saturday, April 9th, noon Eastern is our next Carefree Cooking Lab event on Zoom. This is the monthly event where we all get together on Zoom and cook for the future. So this Saturday, we are going to be cooking up some savvy 
spring suppers, I'm calling it, three entrees for the season that you can eat that night, uh, save one for tomorrow, even next week. It's three entrees for tonight's table, tomorrow's refrigerator, or, or next week's freezer this Saturday. And hey, if you're a member of my Carefree Cooks Insider Cooking Club, you all already all automatically have a free ticket to the event every month. So if you're an insider, your link is coming later this week. We're going to send those out. Just sit tight, watch your email. But you don't have to be an insider to join this live class. It's open to the public. This is where we get together on Zoom. You cook along with me in real time. You can raise your hand, ask me a question directly, or you can just relax and cook all the great stuff later. You get ingredient lists, you get tool lists, you get an entire booklet for the class. So go to web, uh, care, go to carefreecookinglab.com slash register to new new URL carefreecookinglab.com slash register to get your ticket to this premium level event. And I hope we get to speak directly to each other this Saturday. So until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward cracking that carefree cooks code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's always a method to your cooking success.